basically to give you guys a sense of the opportunities that this allied field has for forensic psychology or people who practice law and psychology. Um, that there's opportunities in clinical practice, opportunities in research and scholarship, and also legal and policy work. So we'll kind of be going through all of those. Uh, we've stacked our panel with a variety of different experts who have come at this from different angles. Um, as we all speak, just try and listen and think about how to incorporate what we talk about into your own interests. Um, this is going to be a general overview. Most of you will just be informed in terms of neuropsychology, neuroscience, and that's fine for your careers. For those of you who want more training, specialty training or specialization in neuropsychology, there's other ways that you can get that information. That's not really what we're focused on. Um, one of those ways is you can tune into our next webinar, which is happening in a few weeks. Um, Crystal and Tessa will be talking about um, kind of how you specialize in neuropsychology and how you blend that into your practice in a more structured way. Uh, so you can go to our website, aplsstudents.org slash webinars, and register for that. So we're going to start uh, at the beginning in terms of graduate training. So I'm going to be talking about beyond biological aspects of behavior. Specifically, I'm looking at opportunities during your graduate training um, in neuroscience, neuropsychology. So can I get a sense of, raise your hand if you're a student in this room, graduate student. Okay, undergraduate students and early career professionals. Okay, um, so quick shout out to the early career professional uh, committee. They are our co-sponsors. So I guess they didn't do their job on getting a few here. Uh, that's fine. So we can tailor it to, except for Kathleen, who's the chair. Thanks, Kathleen, for co-sponsoring this event. Um, so we're going to tailor this uh, a little bit more towards graduate training, but. All of us in graduate training are looking ahead towards postdoc and early career, so it, it should be a good uh, perspective. So starting at the beginning, the APA, uh, there are APA guidelines and principles dictating how um, APA accredited sites train their students. So a lot of these are um, trying to direct what exactly programs are providing their students, what types of uh, courses and research and all that kind of stuff. So among those, they say that all programs need to uh, support training in the biological aspects of behavior. They also support by different aspects of behavior, social aspects, multicultural aspects, cognitive, behavioral. If you're in an APA accredited program or not, those probably sound pretty familiar. That's how your curriculum is structured. That's how your administrators have designed your programs to meet these guidelines and principles. So the APA is telling all programs, you need to teach biological aspects of behavior to all of your students. We think that that's important. But they leave it up to the programs in terms of how exactly they, they um, give that information. So some of these may have been your textbooks. Uh, they go at this from a variety of ways. So you can take. Um, required classes in neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, um, psychopharmacology, cognitive neuroscience, or introduction to neuropsychology, principles of neuropsychology, neuropsychological assessment. These are kind of the bread and butter required classes that programs typically use to, to meet this criteria. Um, for most students, this is where they stop. This is, they do the required class, they do the brain lab, they learn the brain, and that's where they stop. They don't go any farther in terms of learning about the biological bases of behavior. But this is, seems kind of unfair because coursework is just one component of our training as graduate students. And required classes is just one component of coursework. So there's also, most likely at all of your institutions, a variety of elective courses related to biological aspects of behavior more advanced neuro classes, or cognitive neuroscience, which adds on to neuroanatomy. Um, so that's another way that if you're interested in this, look at what your programs provide in terms of biological aspects. So Psychopharm is another one that most offer, and it's biologically based. Um, but people usually don't see it like that. They think it's about drugs. But that's another opportunity to learn about 
neuroscience and neuropsychology and how that influences our understanding of human behavior. Outside of coursework, graduate training typically includes um, a large section of practical training. For clinical students, that's clinical externships or practica. Um, for non-clinical students, that's internships, assistantships, uh, policy work, of, they get that a variety of ways. So practical work, applied work in psychology, professional psychology. Another great way to get exposure to neuroscience, neuropsychology, either through clinical placements at neuropsych practices or hospitals where they have a department of neurology who you're working with. Um, and look to the supervisors, look to your pro the brochures to see what kind of aspects they uh, allow. Um, for non-clinical students, look to see who's doing policy in this area in your region and see if you can uh, go with them. If it's working on projects that are related to this as well, that's uh, a good way for non-clinical students to get involved in, in this. The third aspect is research. So we all have to do research as part of our um, programs. Uh, some people it's just learning how to access and utilize the research. Other people are actually doing the research. Theses, dissertations. Regardless of how deeply involved you are in research at your institution, it's another option for uh, focusing more on the biological aspects. Neuroscience, neuropsychology. Um, incorporating neuropsychological perspectives or measures into your own research. Um, seems to be a really good way to learn about it, especially if you have some supervision in your, in your research. Um, and then around all of this, a, a great opportunity that's often overlooked is professional development. It's a huge part of a graduate program, is professional development. Going to conferences, getting to know people, networking, uh, getting to know people in your area and also nationally. So as you're doing this, at APLS. Uh, you can be doing this in neuroscience, neuropsychology. They're allied fields. They have conferences too that you guys are more than welcome to go to. Um, so just consider that these are the core of your training in general. These are the core of your training in law and psychology, and they can also form the core of your training in biological aspects of behavior. So continuing on, most of us will go on to apply for predoctoral internships. This is clinical internships. And the way to think about this in general is your internship should serve one of two purposes. It should balance you out, make you more generally well-rounded. It's also a way to focus and specialize if, if that's what you want to do. And if you're here, you're probably interested in law and psychology. Your mentors are likely to tell you that there are some programs that are more focused on forensic psychology, law and psychology than others. Uh, it's kind of a sliding scale of how much experience you want in law and psychology during your internship. Same thing goes for neuropsych. There are some sites that offer a rotation that's pretty minor. Others are only neuropsych all the time. So the same thing, it's a sliding scale. So if, when you're looking and you're deciding exactly what it is you're looking for in your internship, just consider both of these, forensic psychology and also neuropsychology. And there are a variety of internships out there. There's a ton of them. I just went through the process myself. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But there are some that are very neuropsychologically heavy. SDSU is the type that you do neuropsychology all day there. They're a huge neuropsych program. There's others that are a little bit less. Um, they're just major rotations, but you have also minor rotations that are not in neuropsychology. But for the most part, these are neuropsych internships. Thank you. There's others that are less neuropsych and more forensic. Um, they blend them, they have minor rotations in neuropsychology, but they're focused on giving training in law and psychology, um, more so in neuropsychology. There's a few that blend them perfectly. It's kind of half and half. Um, I ran across two, St. Joe's in Hamilton, Ontario, and Patton State Hospital are two examples of these. They, they tend to do forensic and neuro equally. They give equal measure to both. And then there's some more general. So VAs are, are kind of famous for giving generalist training that might include some forensic, some neuro, but also trauma, substance abuse, anything else that you might want. A more generalist. But if you're just interested in knowing about neuropsychology, not necessarily doing it, 
those could be good options. So this slide is mostly to demonstrate when you're looking at your internships, to think about what rotations they offer, who the supervisors are, what types of didactics are offered, and if there's any research opportunities. And as you weigh how much forensic experience you want, you can also weigh how much neuro experience you want. And just be on the lookout as you look through their brochures. So to give you a quick case example, um, I myself just went through this process of graduate training and uh, matching for internship. This is a picture from my advisor tells me my very first day of graduate school. So <laughs> that's who I was then, this is who I am now. And during my time, I really focused on blending forensic psychology and neuropsychology. At the beginning, it was pretty unstructured. I wasn't sure how much neuropsychology I wanted in my life. Um, currently, I'm, I'm very blended. I'm focused on, on both of them. And I looked to the elective classes. I took a lot of classes in neuropsych. I ended up doing enough to satisfy for the neuropsych rotation or concentration in my school. Um, my practical training, I worked with neuropsychologists in private practice, in state hospitals, in medical hospitals. I tried to focus on forensic training and neuropsych training in my practica. And then rounding out with some generalist ones too. And my research, I've looked at straight forensic psychology, I've looked at straight neuroscience, and then I've also kind of blended the two. My thesis, I surveyed neuropsychologists about their forensic experience. And my dissertation is I'm trying to better predict institutional violence using neuropsychological measures. So I'm applying my experience in both fields to try and answer a question that should be of interest to both fields. And professional development. I'm here, I'm at APLS, I love APLS. Uh, and I also go to neuropsych conferences. I meet neuropsychologists through my practicum supervisors. I, I try and learn what that field is like, because they're different. It's a different group of individuals with some overlap. For internship, because I focus on blending forensic and neuro so much during my uh, training otherwise, for internship, I wanted to go to, go to an internship that was very neuropsych would kind of set me on that path. I decided that I wanted neuroscience to be a big part of my career. And I ended up matching at NYU Rusk, which is half of the year doing neuropsych assessment, half of the year doing neuropsych uh, interventions, rehabilitation, and then I have kind of generalist training throughout. So that seems to be hitting everything that I wanted to do in a, in a really nice way. There's also some opportunities for forensic work within that. Um, so doing neuropsych assessments that there's a legal question at hand. So having said all that, I wanted to leave you guys with um, one way of thinking about all this. So it comes from where Insight usually comes from, the internship brochure for the San Francisco VA. Um, they have a very interesting model. They make everyone that does their internship have a 12 month long neuropsych experience. They don't necessarily have everyone focus in it, but it's part of their training. And here's why. They see neuropsychology as a field that is strongly tied to the rapid advances in clinical neuroscience that are altering our perspective on a range of issues related to the practice of clinical psychology. They think that everyone should get some exposure to neuropsychology because it's tied in with an empirically validated perspective. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of conceptualizing cases and testing hypotheses and writing up reports. It's something else to think about. The biological aspects of human behavior is something that they think everyone should know about. Neuropsychology provides a very good access to that way of thinking. So if you're interested in that, then neuropsychology and neuroscience is something that you might include a little bit more in your pre-doctoral training. So I'm going to hand it off to uh, my other speakers. They're going to take you through uh, graduate training into postdoc and early career. All right, thank you all very much. All right, so I am Stephanie Brooks Holiday. Um, I am currently in the process of wrapping up a neuropsychology postdoc. And so, um, and what I wanted to talk about today, just a couple things. So, first of all, I want to give you an idea of kind of a different type of path from forensic through to neuropsychology than what Casey just described. Um, and then also just kind of 
after sharing my own personal experience, some of the lessons that I kind of drew from that and where I see it going from here. Um, so I'll start just by giving a little bit of background about my path to forensic psychology. So I had an interest in forensic psychology as an undergraduate and kind of with the idea of going to graduate school in mind, wanted to get some research experience. And I got lucky because there was one forensic psychologist at Duke and he happened to be looking for an undergraduate research assistant um, during my senior year and that's how I ended up working with Dr. Eric L. Logan. And this turned out to be a really pivotal experience in my training. I had some opportunity to work on aspects of civil forensic psychology with him, but I also was working on a study of um, the factors associated with risk of violent behavior among veterans. And the reason this was so pivotal is because this was really my first introduction to forensic mental health assessment and the risk assessment as a component of that. Um, so as I finished school, I knew that I wanted to apply to graduate school, but I wanted to get a little bit of more applied experience with a forensic population first, just because I felt like going to a clinical graduate program was kind of a big commitment to make. So I ended up with a barely paid part-time internship for a few months with a pre-release center um, in Montgomery County, Maryland, right after college. And this did confirm my desire to work with the forensic population, but it also ended up influencing some of my research interests. Um, there was a component of risk assessment going on in the selection decisions about who was eligible for this program. But it was also really my first introduction to the way that a <clears throat> kind of more structured treatment program might be able to affect risk of future criminal behavior. And so I went on to get a real job and worked for a couple of years before going back to grad school. But when I applied to grad school, I really was seeking a very forensic experience. So I knew that I wanted to apply to a program with a structured forensic concentration, um, and my research interests were really concentrated both in aspects of risk assessment and in correctional treatment. And um, Drexel was on my radar for those reasons, and I did end up getting accepted to work with Kirk Heilbrunn at Drexel. And while I was in the program, kind of on the Casey, I had pretty much the typical experience of someone within the forensic concentration. So I was a part of forensic research. Um, my thesis and dissertation were both forensically anchored. Um, I had forensic practicum experiences, so I worked for um, a year as a counselor at a correctional facility. I did forensic assessments. But as I got to the stage that clinical internship was more on my radar, I realized that to be a more competitive applicant, I needed to broaden my clinical experiences. So I got a little bit of um, dabbling in health psychology during my third year. And during my fourth year, um, Drex was in Philadelphia, and my husband happened to be in a residency in DC, and so I looked at the options that were available for practicum in DC. And I was specifically looking for a more inpatient psych experience to round out my experiences. And after I contacted the Washington DC VA, they told me they had actually dissolved their inpatient experience, but they did have an opportunity available on their psychosocial rehabilitation unit. So it's basically an intensive outpatient unit and I would be working um, exclusively with veterans with serious mental illness. So it seemed like the right place and the right time um, and that's how I ended up uh, kind of running out my clinical experiences. Now, going through grad school, I really felt like I was probably going to one of the internships that would be classified more towards the forensic or high forensic end of the spectrum. Um, but after having some of those more generalist practical experiences, I realized that what I wanted my internship to do was kind of serve to broaden my experience. I saw it as maybe that last opportunity to get a little bit of everything before specializing again. So I kind of went into internship applications thinking that I wanted to do a generalist internship, um, but was still planning to do a more forensic postdoc. So I matched to internship at the DCBA. And um, the way that internship works at the DCBA, we have three rotations, and you don't select your rotations until you get there. So I arrived ready for internship, and kind of the advice you get from all the supervisors is that you should select rotations up front that are going to be most similar to the types of postdocs that you're applying to. That way you have uh, supervisors who can write you letters of recommendation that are relevant, you have uh, experiences that you can talk about on interviews, so there I am in a completely non-forensic internship 
trying to prepare myself to apply for forensic postdocs and not sure how to do that. And that's how I ended up in a neuropsych rotation. Um, I kind of figured that if nothing else, I would be doing assessment, I would be uh, getting more practice in kind of that gathering of information, the synthesizing of test data with collateral information, the process of report writing, and so I figured if nothing else, having some good solid assessment experience was the way to go. Um, I should say that at this time, I had no neuropsych experience. I'd given the waste and I had done achievement testing, um, but I just got really lucky to have a patient supervisor who was willing to kind of start from scratch with me. Um, and so I started, and the learning curve was enormous, but I found it really interesting. And I do love assessment, and I was kind of hitting on that sweet spot that makes me love forensic assessment so much, which is the idea of putting together the pieces of the puzzle and seeing where the data leads you. And so one neuropsych rotation turned into one and a half neuropsych rotations, and then I kind of negotiated for another component, even though I wasn't supposed to. And at the end of the day, I ended up spending more than half of my internship doing neuropsych assessment. Um, it was kind of broad outpatient neuropsych evaluations for a general clinic. Um, I was getting some brief inpatient referrals, um, the capacity evaluations with the, which the forensic psychologist and me loved, and even working in our polytrauma clinic, which serves veterans with a history of TBI. The other thing that was really formative about that internship experience, other than just finding that I really enjoyed the neuropsych assessment, is I began to have some informal conversations with my supervisors and found that we shared kind of an interest in the prediction of criminal or violent behavior. <coughs> but we approached our thinking about it from two entirely different worlds. I was very familiar with these forensic assessment instruments and these risk assessment instruments, and he was more familiar with some of the literature that's specific to neuropsychology, and it was a completely different way of looking at it for me. It felt like I had just had my mind opened up to this entire new area of psychology, and it was really changing my perspective on how I saw even my own research interests. So I went to the literature, and I found that the forensic literature about risk assessment often has very little mention of cognitive factors. And on the uh, other side of the coin, the neuropsych literature often had little mention of the psychosocial factors that we as forensic psychologists know to be so relevant. In fact, sometimes they would completely select out for people who had one of those risk factors. Um, so what I saw here was really an opportunity for research situated in a place that not many people were doing much work. <clears throat> so when it came to applying for postdocs, um, you know, I still wanted a forensic focus to my training. But I now had this interest in neuropsychology that I wanted to weave into things. Um, so I actually only ended up applying to two fellowships. One of them was kind of a more purely traditional forensic postdoc. Um, but I also, there is kind of a unique neuropsych postdoc at the DCVA um, that is 50% clinical, but also 50% research. So we're a study center, and the focus of the study, and I'm speaking purely as a civilian in saying all of these, not as a government employee. Um, but the research is related to kind of all aspects of post-deployment health. So they weren't doing anything related to forensic topics, but again, just kind of in interacting with these people and having informal conversations, I realized that they were interested in my ideas and that they were kind of willing to take on a less traditional neuropsych postdoc um, because they saw kind of a unique way for me to contribute with my own research. And so <clears throat> that's how I ended up in a neuropsych postdoc at the DCBA, which had you asked me as an undergraduate or even in my second year of graduate school, I would not have anticipated myself at this place. Um, clinically, the work that I'm doing is mostly neuropsych. So I do comprehensive neuropsych evaluations. I do um, brief, more screening type evaluations. Um, I actually work in a clinic that's a second opinion clinic. So we see veterans from around the Southeast region who haven't been able to find a solid answer for their medical symptoms at their home VA. So they get sent to us to try to figure out what's going on. Um, kind of embedded within that, there are some health psychology components. So not forensic at all, pretty traditional neuropsych in a lot of ways. My research, on the other hand, is much more a synthesis of the two interests. Um, so for my postdoc study, I wanted to examine the prediction of offending behavior among 
veterans involved in the criminal justice system. And so in doing this, I wanted to approach it in two ways. First, by looking at kind of our known risk assessment instruments from the general offending populations, um, but also seeing how much additional variance we might be able to explain by including measures of cognitive functioning, and most specifically things related to executive functioning, decision making, um, the ability to weigh consequences before acting. Um, because again, I feel like Forensic has kind of looked at its own area of it, and neuropsych has looked at its own area, but I think how much more powerful could our prediction be if we put it together. So, in kind of thinking about ways that you can do both forensic and neuropsych type things, not just at the postdoctoral level, but kind of how I see this as I move forward into a true early career, um, I think that there are a lot of clinical opportunities to do this. You know, I think about integrating neuropsych into forensic practice. Um, you know, I have definitely seen reports before where there has been a question about cognitive functioning and the neuropsych component of the testing has been referred out to a neuropsychologist. And then it's the forensic psychologist who's integrating everything into the results. And I just think, who is better positioned to, first of all, be a one-stop shop for all the testing, but then to really meaningfully integrate both the forensic and the neuropsych data and someone who has specialized training in both of these areas. You know, I also think that in terms of integrating the forensic into the neuropsych, I know that my forensic training has truly impacted my approach to neuropsych testing. Um, you know, I think about the way that I form hypotheses before I do the testing. I think about the way that I am very objective in my gathering of information and how I really let the data lead me to a conclusion. Now, I think that some supervisors occasionally see me as maybe a little skeptical or maybe a little objective in my approach. Um, but, you know, my recommendations are still very therapeutic in nature, but I also think that they're really solidly evidence-based, just based on the data that I've collected. And I think that that's how you're best going to help the patient that you're seeing. I also think that there are some real research opportunities out there. Um, you know, I think we're just really only scratching the surface of forensic neuropsych research. So I was actually at a neuropsych conference last month and in one of the poster sessions, there was a forensic neuropsych theme. And there were only eight posters and five of them were related <coughs> to like, performance or symptom or diagnostic validity. Um, two of them were about prevalence of cognitive diagnoses in correctional populations, things like you know, cognitive disorder, TBI. And one of them was about confidence restoration. So all important areas, but I think that there are just going to be so many more opportunities to look at the way that these disciplines inform one another and how you can synthesize, kind of like the study that Casey described for his dissertation or what I was trying to do with my postdoc research. I also think that you are opening yourself up in terms of funding opportunities. So as a grad student doing kind of more pure forensic things, I was mostly looking at funding from things like APLS or AAFP, whereas in looking at my postdoc research, it opened up some of these neuropsych options or even some of these more broad-based options like the APF. And so I think you're uniquely positioning yourself. I think that in terms of challenges or just kind of navigating being a part of both fields is you just have to be prepared to serve as an ambassador for the other field, depending on who you're working with. Um, and I think that this works both in terms of clinical and research. So I think that in my pseudo-forensic approach to neuropsych assessment, I've just had to explain why I approach things in that way and why I think I'm getting the best data possible. Um, in my research, uh, especially since I'm working mostly with neuropsych supervisors, I just had to explain to them the evidence base of our forensic assessment instruments because they just don't really have them on their radar. So I think that forensic psychologists do something really unique, and neuropsychologists do something really unique. They just don't always know what the other is doing. Um, and I think that that comes up when applying for funding, too. You know, if I apply for uh, funding from APLS, I would have to really do a good job of explaining why I think these cognitive factors are going to play an important role above and beyond kind of our traditional forensic way of thinking about things, and vice versa. So I will just end with a quick kind of moving forward slide. So you're actually catching me with only three months left on my fellowship. And so in terms of that project that I described, you know, I think that in any project you're going to learn things about implementation and challenges and things that you might do differently the next time. But what I have found is that I think that this training 
is really going to open up a lot of opportunities. Um, I do tend towards a little more of a research focus, and I think that it's opened up a completely new field, and with it, just a broader set of ideas and the way that I'm conceptualizing things. And in terms of where I see clinical practice going, again, I feel like I am now equipped with this dual skill set that can only be a valuable asset. Thank you. Okay, so I have a disclosure to make at the outset. I'm not a neuroscientist, nor a neuropsychologist. I wish I was now that I found out there's $5.5 billion on here. <laughs> um, um, I am a lawyer. And so I'm not going to be the kind of role model that these few folks are going to be for you. My job is to tell you how the legal system might react to neuroscientific information, and specifically how the criminal justice system might react to it. And Kate's already sort of given away my punchline, which is it, it, it doesn't react very positively to it. At least when it's devoted to trying to mitigate criminal liability at trial or reduce punishment at sentencing. So that's going to be my basic message. As you, can, as you can see from my title, it's not a very optimistic one, at least based on what we know right now. But I do have three caveats to this. Um, first of all, how many of you saw Dr. Goldstein talk? Okay, well I have to change my whole talk because of what he said. <laughs> right? Because what he said is we are getting somewhere with neuroscientific studies. We are starting to learn not just about correlations, but causations. And part of my talk is suggesting we don't know too much about causation yet. Well, he's proven me wrong. His research has proven me wrong. So you're going to have to keep that in the back of your head while I'm talking about this stuff. Um, a second uh, caveat is that I'm going to be talking mostly about neuroscientific or neurological information, not neuropsychological information. I think actually neuropsych, right now at least, has a much stronger role to play than straight neuroscience. Why? Because you guys are talking about behavior, which is what the law ultimately cares about. Uh, much more so than a brain scan or a fMRI lab. Okay? And the last caveat I'm going to make is that I am going to be focusing mostly on the usefulness of neuroscience for criminal liability. And again, my message is pretty pessimistic. But there are also collateral issues in the criminal justice system, like comps to proceed and dangerousness and treatability, where I think neuroscience can have a fairly positive role, fairly major role to play. So, let me start first by talking about neuroscience and criminal liability, in particular at trial. Um, and my basic message is here, um, just like with many other kinds of scientific evidence, it's not going to have much of an impact given current doctrines. Current doctrines are very narrowly construed. Uh, it's very, very hard to get any kind of mitigation at trial. There are basically four doctrines that a person who has neuroscientific evidence might try to address with that evidence. All of them are very narrowly defined. Uh, the first doctrine is the involuntary act doctrine. It's not what the name implies. It's not a super impulsivity doctrine. It, basically, what the defendant has to show is there's no link between mind and body, okay, as with an epileptic seizure. Okay, there's no link between brain and behavior. That's very, excuse me, brain and body action. That's very hard to prove. Very few people can get this kind of defense. The second kind of defense, lack of mens rea or diminished capacity defense. This is focused on whether the person could intend the act with which he or she is charged. Firstly, no one can prove this defense either. Many severely psychotic people intend their acts. So it's a very narrowly defined defense. Most people who have brain aberrations are going to intend their behavior. They might be impulsive, but they're still going to intend it. So this kind of behavior, this kind of defense probably won't work either. The defense where neuroscience is most likely to be relevant is the insane defense, which you're all familiar with. The insane defense requires a mental disease or defect. And I think People with a neurological operation can make a pretty plausible argument they got a mental defect. That's probably not going to be the problem. We saw those pictures of brains that Dr. Goldstein was showing, normal, abnormal. There's a pretty significant, uh, serious and significant defect there. The problem is showing that that defect caused either significant cognitive or volitional impairment. Those are the two prongs of the insanity defense. And that can be very difficult. Even very severely psychotic people have a very hard time proving insanity defense. So again, I don't have real good news here. I think it's going to be very hard for neuroscience to make much headway here. Now, you might think, well, at least in sentencing, there'd be a possibility, right? You might not be able to get acquittal or a major reduction in charge, but at least in sentencing, there's a little bit more leeway. And it's true, there is more leeway. But at least in non-capital sentencing cases, it's still difficult to get mitigating impact out of neuroscience evidence. Why, for instance, in the federal sentencing guidelines, uh, the defendant has to show that they're significantly impaired volitionally, or they don't get anywhere, and even that mitigation argument is not available if the conviction is for a violent offense. 
Now, some states have more generous sentencing guidelines, but a lot of states follow the federal government. So in non-capital cases, it's not going to be very easy. Capital cases, different story. As you probably all know, the Supreme Court has been very careful in this particular context. It said we have to be super reliable before we can condemn someone to death. So virtually anything can be introduced. Okay. Everything plus the kitchen sink can be introduced. Um, so that's why you see, based on research by Deborah Denno, in other words, uh, other people, and the reason I mentioned Deborah Denno, because she's talking here tomorrow. You might want to go see her presentation. Um, she's found that most neuroscientific evidence is introduced in capital cases, and about 25% of all capital cases involve neuroscientific evidence. And it's because of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence in this area. But there is a problem here. Some of you are familiar with it, the double-edged sword problem. Neuroscientific evidence, it tends to show a person has a hard time controlling behavior. Also, it tends to suggest the aggravating circumstance of dangerousness. Right? If you have a hard time controlling behavior, you're a scary person. And 27 out of the 32 states that are the death penalty, dangerousness is an aggravating factor. So it really puts defense attorneys between a rock and a hard place. Deborah Dano has found, for instance, that prosecutors rarely present evidence in aggravation using neuroscience. They rarely use neuroscience evidence to prove aggravation. Why not? They don't need to. Defense doesn't form. Defense puts the neuroscience um, evidence uh, to the jury, and the jury might draw the wrong conclusion from it. Um, so the bottom line is I'm not very optimistic about um, the neuroscientific impact in the criminal trial. But that doesn't mean I'm giving up. First of all, we've got Dr. Goldstein to fall back on. Uh, but without really mentioning too much about what his research is saying right now, um, because it hasn't really translated yet to the criminal court, there are five ways of, in which I think neuroscience evidence can be introduced in a criminal trial that might be relevant to all of you in your research, or at least in terms of what you're thinking about doing for a career. Um, the first type is the most common. Uh, it's presenting uh, a scan or fMRI data that shows abnormality. This is a very common use of neuroscience evidence. Um, I have up here FLD, that stands for frontal lobe disorder, and I'm just going to call it FLD. This is uh, probably the most common way in which neuroscientific evidence is introduced. Unfortunately, at least it's a theoretical and technical matter, it's not very useful to the law. As you can see, I say almost useless. Um, why do I say that? First of all, it doesn't show causation. Again, this is what Dr. Goldstein's research gets at, but just because someone has an FLD, doesn't mean the FLD caused the crime. It's a very simple syllogism that prosecutors present to the jury all the time. And it's true, right? And in fact, in, in response to one of the questions uh, this afternoon, Dr. Goldstein admitted that there are a lot of people that have the kind of brain pattern he showed who don't end up getting aggressive. So you have to explain that kind of thing. Um, the, one example of where you do have causation evidence, but just to show how hard this is to do, how many of you have heard of the Orc case? This is a guy who committed very inappropriate antisocial sexual acts over and over again, sometimes in front of eyewitnesses. So clearly very impulsive. Doctors examined him. They found a tumor in his brain. They removed the tumor. All of a sudden, the sexualized conduct disappeared. Six months later, he started acting the same way again. Doctors examined him again, found the tumor regrown. Removed the tumor, boom, behavior's gone. Well, that's very solid evidence of causation, but you don't get that hardly ever, OK? But even if you can show causation, you've got the second problem, which has been repeated by Stephen Morse over and over and over again. Have you ever heard Stephen Morse talk? He said this, I guarantee it. And what he says is causation is not excuse. Causation is not compulsion. If causation was excuse, every criminal defendant would have to be excused. Why? Because all crime is caused. All crime is caused by something. We've got evidence, for instance, there's a high correlation between low serotonin levels and criminal activity. There's no way the law is going to excuse a person with low serotonin just because they got low serotonin. You have to show the low serotonin significantly caused, significantly caused the crime, and that's very hard to show. Okay, there's another kind of neuroscientific evidence that can be presented. Um, philosophers call, uh, call it evidence about the cause of an effect. How many violent people have FLD? So an example of this is the Bryan study, uh, named after the lead author of that study. He looked at 110 prison inmates. 55 of whom had committed a violent crime, 55 of whom had committed a nonviolent crime. And he found, stunningly, that 73% of the people who had committed a violent crime had FLD. And only 28% of the people who had committed a nonviolent crime had FLD. Well, if I were a defense attorney, I think I'd get very excited. Unfortunately, it's pretty much irrelevant. Okay? All it tells us is a lot of people who are violent have FLD. It doesn't tell us how many people with FLD act violently. And that's what the law ultimately wants to know. It wants to know how significant FLD is in terms of the contributory factor. That's what the next, the third type of research gets at. Prevalence data. And there is prevalence data, which suggests, for instance, that 
Um, people with FLD are 10 to 20 percent more likely to commit a violent crime than people who don't have FLD. Well, now here we're starting to get into uh, what can really influence legal decision making. We're seeing that, in fact, there is um, some predisposition on the part of people with FLD to commit violent crime. The problem is, you can't really understand the importance of this unless you know the base rate for violence among people without FLD. Well, it turns out that base rate is very low. So, for instance, if it's only 2%, I'm sort of making this up, but based on the fact that none of my friends are violent, I'm assuming the base rate for violence is 2%. Uh, what does that mean that the base rate for violence is with respect to people with FLD? Very low, 22 to 2.4%. That's not very exciting uh, as an exculpatory defense. Um, I'm going to skip that part uh, so I can get to the last two ways in which neuroscience can be relevant. And the next way in which neuroscience can be uh, introduced, and this is more relevant to, to neuropsych, I think, the kind of stuff that you all do. Uh, these other studies are based on nomothetic information, at least the second and third types are nomothetic in orientation, right? Group-based, law doesn't tend to like that kind of research anyway. This is focusing on the individual defendant. So what does it involve? It involves uh, making the defendant carry out certain tasks, and you all know these tasks. These have to do with trying to measure the impulsivity of an individual in a way that apparently gets that neurological functioning, so there's a go-no-go -no -go test, a stop-signal test, and so on. Okay? Then you get the results from the defendant and compare it to the baseline results for the general population. Okay? And if the defendant falls well below the 50 percentile, the 25th percentile, then maybe we've got something going for us if we're defendants, if we're defense attorneys. Um, several problems. First of all, it's very easy to malinger in these tests because a choice has to be made. You have to choose whether to go or not to go, for instance. So that can follow accept the results. Uh, secondly, you need baseline data for a large range of demographic populations, uh, men and women, different age groups. It's not impossible to get this, but it's very difficult to get this kind of information. And thirdly, there's a normative or ethical issue. Okay, uh, where do we draw the line in, 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 with respect to mitigation? If you're below the 50 percentile, does that mean you get mitigation? Or do you have to below, be below the 25th percentile or the 1st percentile? So that's a difficult, difficult normative issue. The last kind of neuroscience evidence I want to talk about I think avoids most of these problems. This is where you get a brain scan of the defendant or fMRI data about the defendant in response to certain stimuli. You get those results and then you compare those results to uh, brain scan or fMRI data uh, from the average of uh, populations that we know are legally entitled to mitigation, like juveniles and people with intellectual disability. Okay, that's the comparison you're making. And that avoids a lot of the problems I'm talking about. Um, why? Oh, shoot. Um, I don't know what's going on here. Well, what this says is, it's very hard to malinger a brain scan. And it's very hard to malinger fMRI imaging data. Okay, so the malingering problem is pretty much gone. Also, we have the baseline information. We know the baselines we want. We want juveniles and people with intellectual disability. We get the averages of those two groups. And the normative question, in terms of the cutoff, we know what that is too, because the Supreme Court has told us, and you would see this if you could, uh, in the Roper case, that juveniles are entitled to mitigation, and people with intellectual disability are exempt from the death penalty. So, this, uh, well, okay, what this does is it introduces the idea of science, what I call scientific stare decisis. What's scientific stare decisis? It, basically means that people who are, are similar scientifically should be treated the same way legally. So if a 30-year-old's brain is like a juvenile's brain, a 30-year-old will be treated like a juvenile and given the same mitigating effect. And the Supreme Court has more or less endorsed this idea in a recent case called Sears versus Upton, decided in 2010, where it reversed a death sentence of an individual who scored below the first percentile on various cognitive tests, apparently based on FLD. And what the court said is that even though the FLD didn't clearly begin before age 18, which is what you need to have intellectual disability under the Atkins exemption, it was willing to excuse this person or mitigate this person's liability because um, no matter what the cause of brain damage, and I wish we could read this because I don't remember the exact quote, it's on here somewhere, no matter what the cause of brain damage, that person deserved mitigation. That's the scientific story to Sice's point. Um, let's see if this comes up visibly. So, I think there is some hope for neuroscience um, and criminal culpability. The collateral issues I mentioned, am I out of time? Okay, the collateral issues I mentioned, this is the last slide I have, I think actually are issues where right now at least neuroscience can be even more useful. So take competency to proceed, or competency to stand trial. Uh, let's say the individual um, is given several tests 
that tend to, deter to determine that the person is incompetent to proceed. But you know what the prosecutor is going to argue, especially in a capital case where the stakes are high. He's going to say, this guy's in my He's faking the incompetence. Obviously, neuroscientific evidence can be very useful here, especially if it can show the defendant's uh, <coughs> brain results are very similar to the results you get from a person with serious intellectual disability. It's that scientific study size this idea again. You compare the defendant to um, the average of people we know are impaired. There's been a lot of interesting neuro neuroscientific research, and uh, this has already been mentioned, on risk assessment. And in fact, there's some pretty significant research showing correlations between certain kinds of brain structures and, and brain imaging results and low and high risk. Um, and now, there are a lot of ethical normative issues surrounding this kind of research, which I'm not going to get into. My point here is this kind of research is much easier to do than the kind of culpability research that I was talking about earlier. Why? Because we know the criterion very well. We know whether the person's been violent or not. Culpability, who knows what that is? We don't have a gold standard to determine whether someone's culpable or not culpable. We do know that someone's been violent or not violent. So this kind of research can be done much more cleanly than the culpability research. And finally, there's treatment efficacy. And I think there are a lot of interesting things to be done here. You can do a pre-post methodology, where you look and see what a person's brain looks like before treatment and after treatment. There are a lot of third variables you've got to take care of, but considerably, that could be a way neuroscience could be useful. And of course, you can also compare the um, individual has been treated uh, uh, to the dangerousness literature and see whether after the treatment of the person is low risk, which is of course what we want to produce after treatment occurs. So sorry for going so quickly. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
asked to, to weigh on. Um, there are other ones, like the measures that Steph and I are using, a lot of them are very strange, esoteric tests, but they measure behavior that might actually be informative. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to show how giving someone a image of a zoo and having someone kind of map their way through it, how that will directly translate into whether they're going to be a problem in the institution or not. That's where kind of our role is going to come in as translational uh, advocates for this, explaining and demonstrating. And I think right now we can't. I think right now there's not enough work, um, not enough evidence to, to prove that it's worth their while. So hopefully in the next few years that type of work will come out. Yeah, and just to add on to that a little bit, so I, I haven't had the experience going in that direction, but I have had a little bit of experience going in the opposite direction, which is trying to advocate for some forensically relevant things in a more neuropsych setting. And it, it, kind of what Casey was saying, I think that a lot of the problem is there's just not a lot of understanding of how our methods have developed and those types of things. I mean, even something as basic as getting into a conversation with a supervisor about how a structured professional judgment instrument can be just as good as an actuarial instrument and it's not equivalent to an unstructured clinical judgment. Um, they, they just don't have the vocabulary for that, let alone some of the research knowledge that underlies that. So a lot of it has just been kind of breaking things down from scratch and finding those types of good overview studies and just giving a good education. And I find that that has been most effective on kind of a micro level and getting those things. Because like I said before, it's Pretty, it's starting to become more prevalent in the inpatient setting, but where I was at last year in the outpatient setting, it's, it's not there. Yes. I'm just going to give you a different perspective. I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. I'm ABAP, and I do some forensic work. And it's really interesting just the way that the waves kind of crash against each other. When I come in from a neuropsych perspective, I always think that I'm trying to get to the bottom line. So there's a tremendous amount of data that's gathered history and so forth. And uh, sometimes the forensic world is so different because you're trying to answer a specific question. Do you sense that bind? And uh, just wanted you to comment on it. The reason why I, I would offer as, as an example, a consult I did where I was asked to do a death penalty mitigation and a forensic psychologist who was also ABAP in neuropsychology came into the evaluation and just answered the question, was the patient competent to stand trial? and did not put down that the patient had a dementia. And the patient had a huge traumatic brain injury weeks before, but they had just answered the question and yet left that un, you know, kind of that other part unanswered, you know, is there a mitigating factor that might be important in the trial? So I'm just wondering, what have you seen? You guys have gone both ways. What have you seen? Sure, I mean, I have definitely experienced that myself, being the person, and this was in a more clinical setting than a forensic setting, but being the person who's prepared to answer the question of this person's capacity to make a medical decision as an inpatient and answering the question and having my supervisor ask me, well, what about the next piece of it? And so I think absolutely, I think that is one of the things that has been most valuable about getting the formalized training in both areas is because I think that the two have truly complemented each other. I, mean, I think one of the difficult things about forensic work that's sometimes hard for clinical people to get to wrap their heads around is the law wants to answer specific questions. It sounds like the law wanted an answer only to the competency question. You did that, but you also saw, saw some mitigating evidence. The law, unless it's asked you for it, doesn't want the mitigating stuff. It only wants to know about competency to stay in trial. Maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. No, you're not. Okay. Um, now, that doesn't mean you can't suggest to the professor, hey, hey, there's something here that's mitigating. <laughs> Do something about that. Okay? But the question you apparently were asked was competency, and it's your job is just to answer the competency question. By the way, though, in as rich a detail as you can, you don't just say he's competent or incompetent. You provide all the data that's relevant to that question, of course, to the court. But you're not supposed to address mitigation, which could be uh, a reliance different kinds of data. Yeah, so in this example, the forensic psychologist who was also a neuropsychologist put down the patient was depressed or whatever. But it's not a mitigating factor. <laughs> but they didn't add in a dementia mm -hmm. due to traumatic brain injury. Which well, I would think that'd be relevant to competence. I would have put that in on the competence report. Yeah, right. should, I thought it, I thought it should be. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, I think you're touching on something that a lot of people for, for whom forensic mental health evaluations are being done. There's the legal question, and then there's also the clinical questions that will bear upon how they're treated after the legal decision is made.
So something for competency, competency restoration, how likely is it that this person is able to be restored to competence will be hugely influential for where the individual ends up after the decision is made. So that's why, that's why I'm personally excited about neuropsychology is because it does help with the legal decision making by bringing in that perspective that might bear on the clinical decisions that are made after the legal decision. I gotta tell you too, just one more comment. Um, it's just fascinating how neuropsychology has changed during my lifetime. Because now we actually use, uh, you know, uh, malingering instruments, right? Before we used, you know, Ray 15 item memory tests. Now we have things that have been developed by this population and will be developed by you in the next generation that are trying to be more sensitive. And that's where the neuroscience is going too. Will you be able to detect somebody's line in an fMRI scenario or something? I just think it's fascinating how the two uh, interact with each other. It's great. I wish you all well. Thanks. I also think it, it's sort of an important point uh, in, in saying, what can we answer without needing all the bells and whistles? And in some ways, I think sometimes neuroscience has tried to do that. I think there are fancy ways of answering questions. Something like confidence to stand trial might not necessarily need imaging. And, and there's a way to put that in there, but I also think it's sort of important to figure out where it's necessary and where it becomes potentially extraneous and sometimes misleading. And, and I feel like that, to me, is sort of the most difficult part about incorporating, at least I can speak for neuroscience, but incorporating neuroscientific knowledge into answering forensic questions. Can I just comment back to you then? So for example, now at the Cleveland Clinic, a place I'm affiliated with, now when you refer a patient for imaging studies, like for an Alzheimer's workup, you're getting an, you know, all the areas of interest drawn and a mathematical equation done and a predict predictive model based upon your neuroimaging. So I think science is just taking us, neuroscience is taking us forward, and I hope it contribute, continues to take forward forensic psychology as well. I like what you're doing. I, I think the issue is incremental, right? It's how much incremental additional value can neuroscience add and, and to, to sort of, and sometimes it can and sometimes um, at this time, maybe not so much. I understand. Well, I think as a defense attorney, which is the perspective I was taking a little while ago, two things influenced me as to whether I want neuroscience. First of all, how expensive it is. Uh, most <laughs> people defendants are indigent. They can't afford this kind of stuff. And of course, it be very generous. It's not going to happen, period. But secondly, it's how strong my behavioral evidence is. Because law is ultimately behavioral. Um, and so if my client clearly just doesn't understand what an attorney does, or doesn't understand the charges, I don't need to learn neurological evidence. It's only if the prosecutor is arguing that my client's malingering that I might want the neuroscientific evidence to rebut the charge of malingering. And the same thing goes with culpability or dangerousness. Uh, I would much rather just have the straight, the kind of stuff that Dr. Goldstein was talking about. Remember he said, family members will say, we have to restrain you. Right. He's saying, restrain me or I'll kill somebody. That's very strong behavioral evidence. I don't need neuroscience if I've got that kind of testimony, unless the prosecutor says, I don't believe it when he says that, I think he's making it up. Then I might want Dr. Goldstein to testify. <clears throat> all right, well, I thank you all for coming. Um, if you would like to know more, again, we have the uh, webinar at the end of this month talking about how to approach more specialized training in neuropsychology, so we invite you to attend that. And uh, thank you all for coming very much.